Howdy, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We'll wait for a handful of more folks to trickle in. And for now, I would love for anybody who is on the line to go ahead and test the question and answer functionality of Zoom. So you can start off by just entering in what city you're calling from today. Uh, and we'll make sure that everybody gets set up on the QA. Welcome. This is the awkward part of a webinar where we're just waiting for more folks to roll in. So if you're joining us already, thank you so much. And go ahead, test out the QA functionality of Zoom by entering in where you're calling from today. We've got West Palm Beach, San Francisco, Fort Lauderdale. Howdy to folks from Torrance and Brooklyn, Baltimore, of course. So we're just waiting for a couple more folks to come onto the line. Uh, go ahead and enter where you're calling from in the QA functionality to make sure that you know where that is and the, you know that it's working. Howdy to Albuquerque and Richmond, Charlotte. This is great. So we've got a really good representative couple of folks. Philadelphia is now on the line. Hi, everyone. Um, all right, I think that people are feeling good about the QA and we're seeing a good number of folks on the line. So we'll go ahead and get started. We'll take a look at the agenda first off. And so uh, before we kick things off too far, we're going to give some brief introductions. And then I will go into a little bit of an overview of what the Swiftly Connected Transit Platform is. That's really one of the, the things that's bringing us all together today. And I want to set some context there. Then the bulk of the conversation will really be a discussion with our amazing panelists. And we will, of course, round things out with question and answer from the audience. So as we go along, if questions pop into your mind, go ahead and throw those into the QA. Um, you can also wait until the end, but it's always great to get those off your mind. And so you can really focus and pay attention to the content as we go. So with that said, I would love to start with some very brief introductions. We'll go a little more deeply after the intros. Uh, so I am Meredith Bordoni. I am the Chief Product Officer at Swiftly, and I am very excited to be the moderator of today's panel discussion. Um, let's start with you, Connie, and then we'll go to Chris and Josh. Good afternoon, at least here on the East Coast. Connie Engler, pronouns is she, her. I am the Director of Transit and Technical Operations operations with Green Mountain Transit. We are a um, multimodal uh, agency of 111 uh, vehicles uh, across much of northern uh, Vermont uh, with urban, rural, medical, and uh, uh, demand response services in our portfolio across the, at least three counties, three counties. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, wherever uh, you may be. Chris Mandrell, General Manager, City Bus in Lubbock, Texas, um, out in the the uh, kind of not quite the panhandle of Texas, about out in West Texas, um, kind of an urban population. We have about 300,000 um, people here um, with the major university of Texas Tech University. So we've, um, you know, fixed route um, university service um, and all the, you know, all the cool things we're doing out here. Hello everyone, I'm Josh Drucker. Um, I, I'm the assistant general manager of operations at RTA of Central Maryland which is a transit agency right in between Baltimore and DC in Maryland. So uh, we are really a suburban uh, system, not really rural or urban, just kind of right in the middle, um, right in between the two cities. Thanks everyone. Like I said, we'll go a little bit deeper into uh, your networks after I give this spiel, which is to help us anchor the conversation into really what we're talking about today, which is proactive operations. So. Swiftly is the first connected transit platform. We work with over 115 transit agencies and operators in eight countries uh, and ever growing. So on the right hand side, you see a handful of folks that we work with, very proud to partner with agencies large and small. And what in the world is a connected transit platform? I spent a couple moments here just talking about where we are today, why we're here, and how that's really uh, changing the landscape of operations before we dive into talking about how that works in practice with our panelists. 
So sometimes I, I'm kind of cliche in the sense that I think about, uh, I want to understand where we are by looking at where we've come from. And so let's take a, a walk back to kind of the status quo of managing transit, which got a huge leg up at one point in time from data radio, really powering visibility into where vehicles are in the system. This kind of overnight dramatic shift into managing the efficiency of the network. The, the folks in the operations control center could finally see exactly where vehicles were um, on you know, automated vehicle location maps and start to understand if they were running the service that they thought they should be running. Amazing. Now we look at the landscape and how things have really evolved to say that we have immense technology at our fingertips. Uh, the internet has obviously changed a lot of industries, has made things much more uh, accessible and, and in a lot of ways more readily available. And we also have a customer base, a rider base that expects more because of the changes in technology. And so a connected trans, uh, transit platform not only tries to look at where vehicles are, but instead it, it also looks at where vehicles were and where they're going to be. And it doesn't only give visibility for that information uh, to folks in the OCC or folks in dispatch, but it shares that information more broadly, more readily with a variety of stakeholders so that mobility really becomes this connected part of a broader mobility ecosystem or so that transit becomes more of that uh, connected part of the ecosystem. And so uh, who are those stakeholders? Surprise, they're on this slide. And I'll walk us through kind of what each uh, stakeholder gets out of a connect connected transit platform. So we'll start with passengers. And of course, I love starting with passengers. This is really where Swiftly started in terms of offering real-time passenger information. But we did that because it's also where transit agencies start, right? This is all of our customer. We really want to make sure that the transit is great for riders in, in any environment. And so when we think about where vehicles are, it's not enough just to document that. It's not enough just to know that. It's really paramount that we share that too. We share it with passengers wherever they are, on smartphones, wayside signage, websites, so that they can effortlessly uh, plan their travel and make sure they catch their ride. So Connected Transit Platform really has the passenger at kind of the heart of the operation. When we think about staff, um, I mentioned this, that you know there was this huge boon to visibility in, in the operations control environment, being able to see where vehicles are. But increasingly, it's just as important that other staff also know where those vehicles are in real time. You think about customer service, um, security, risk, management, anyone who's really interested in understanding what is going on in real time and how any changes or, or dynamic um, service adaptions have been laid out on the network. It's really important that everybody has visibility into what's going on. It's also really important that the changes in a network that might happen dynamically also make their way to the historical information that's used by planning, that's used by scheduling, that's used by operations staff to really fine tune the network. So we think about connecting with staff and making sure that all of that data becomes kind of a common language so that everybody isn't in their silos, but can work together on making transit really a lot stronger. Connecting with vehicles, uh, we mentioned, or I mentioned data radio, uh, that's certainly been an amazing asset in public transit, but more and more we do see vehicles uh, kind of becoming connected in the very real sense. So uh, wireless modems going on board these vehicles dramatically changes what can and can't be done uh, in this environment. So a connected transit platform really seeks to empower the vehicle operator and also of course the riders on board those vehicles with dynamic changes as they're made to the network so that uh, everybody's informed. It's not just a, a handful of folks, but it's everybody that needs information about detours, about vehicles going in or out of service, et cetera. Uh, they get to stay in the loop even if they're already on board the vehicle. And lastly, um, we think it's paramount in this day and age to not only think about how a transit agency is running their service, but also to leverage the power of other applications, software applications, hardware applications, and even infrastructure applications to make sure that um, transit is part of a rich and vibrant mobility ecosystem. And so Swiftly has you know, dozens of 
partners, um, but we also see a lot of novel use cases for our data via API for, for folks that we uh, don't particularly work with, but can make, can make use of that data to really power some innovative experiences in public transit. And what's most exciting to me is, of course, I don't even know what all of those use cases might be as we look ahead to um, some of the unknowns and ambiguity of something like smart cities. So a connected transit platform uh, is what Swiftly does, and it's what we're doing in a variety of forms for the panelists today. And it is really about providing opportunities to proactively manage your transit network, proactively connect with other stakeholders so that you can get ahead of service issues and not just manage your assets. And so without further ado, with all of that context now set, I would love to get to know our panelists. And so again, starting with you, Connie, um, if you could give maybe a, a, some richer perspective on what Green Mountain is doing and uh, how your service is operated, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, so we're in Vermont in the mountains. We have both urban and uh, rural service. Our relationship with uh, Swiftly began about three years ago. Our, our planning department, Jamie and Chris, have been just extra extraordinarily uh, instrumental in this program uh, to help operations become a better organization. Uh, we had a lot of issues in terms of the the, the late the data latency for GPS, and I think that was the first um, uh, business issue we we're trying to tackle. Uh, and Swiftly provides uh, a far greater accuracy in the in the GPS feed, which was really uh, mission critical job one. On uh, that, in turn, also improved the uh, on time predictability, the prediction um, algorithms, which is really critical to our customers. So, um, yeah, it's been a it's been a great. Uh, a great platform for us and we continue to build off of it. The service adjustments piece of it um, in terms of being able to put detour management has been um, uh, such an extraordinary feature that for us and all of the, the looking back in terms of where something was or wasn't helps us uh, provide transparency and uh, clarity on what did happen and uh, helps us plan for the future. Thanks, Connie. Um, Chris, take us to Lubbock. Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, out we're kind of we're an urban system out in a rural area out in West Texas, and so um, you know we we operate a city fixed route system, but probably the biggest uh, component of our system that we operate is our university service. Um, with 40, 40 plus thousand students, obviously that's the big driver of what we do. Um, we also you know, obviously run um, complementary paratransit, transit, but another um, service we uh, turned on as a result of the pandemic was our micro transit service. And so we have been looking as we've tried to kind of re, you know, recover out of the pandemic and um, we've really been trying to figure out how we can take our micro service and, 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 and make that a complement to our fixed route service. Because at some points right now we have micro transit competing with our fixed route um, and, and that's just not an effective way for us to, to run, our, um, run our business. So we're really trying to find, figure out how we can make those complements. So we, We've uh, really turned to technology and to, to, to help us out in that regard. Um, and one of the things that we want to do is by to connect those two, but you have to be able to connect real time information or real time information. And um, the way we've been doing it in the past is, you know, we, we've got this micro transit, which brings in real time information, but we also have this fixed route service that is static. And so we're, we're using Swiftly, we're a new customer. We're actually in our implement, implementation phase of Swiftly. So we're, we're pretty uh, infant in that regard, but um, a lot of um, things out on the horizon, kind of the, the future of what we see um, connecting, using Swiftly to provide us the GTFS RT, um, that feed, connect that with our micro transit, and really have a live um, service that we can put out to the public and really bring everything together. So it's all complementing one another instead of competing to some extent. So um, it's kind of where we're headed with Swiftly, and I think it's going to be a, a great product for us. Um, and so uh, happy to be here today to kind of talk about what we're, we're looking into. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, Josh, I know you are uh, traveling right now, but transport us back to Maryland with you. Yeah, so we have about 40 fixed route vehicles with complimentary paratransit service um, in our area. Um, we operate over three counties and, and an extra city, um, just connecting everyone in that area. Um, and we are working on 
coming back from the pandemic, trying to increase our service levels uh, to the pre-pandemic levels and then work towards our um, goal of increasing it uh, beyond that. Uh, during that time though, we're trying to get our technology together. So with less ridership and, and uh, less vehicles on the road, just due to uh, driver shortage, we're kind of trying to use that time to get a, all the tech together. We're trying to uh, get automatic passenger counters approved um, and get our, um, our automatic automated voice announcements going. Um, really anything we can do, we're trying to get some um, those uh, ticket validators on our vehicles so way people can make purchases with their with the app and then scan it in and then maybe even in the future move to just buying tickets using your debit or credit card right there on the vehicle. Um, so that's that's what our goal is try try and use this time with less ridership and less vehicles on the road due to the driver shortage to get our technology uh, as far as far as we can get it during that time. Great, thank you everyone. Um, interesting to take advantage of the downturn in such a proactive way. Thank you, Josh. So I'm going to, to kill my screen share now so that we can focus on just the people in front of us and we'll launch into a conversation. So um, I do wanna remind everybody that the QA functionality is at the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom screen. So if anything comes to mind while you're listening to these questions or, or something kind of tangentially related, go ahead and drop that in and then we'll get to the Q&A. Um, toward the end of the webinar. All right, so I mentioned uh, proactive operations and thinking about not just understanding where vehicles happen to be, but also thinking about where they might be and informing other stakeholders and, and kind of getting on the same page. And I'd be curious about how your investments around data quality and producing data in standard formats, uh, specifically GTFS, as you were mentioning, Chris, uh, has helped your staff be more proactive and less reactive with operational challenges. For example, how has your process on detours or service changes evolved now that you're able to put in something like service adjustments in GTFS real-time format? So I'll open the floor, um, but maybe since you were talking about uh, the excitement around getting that real-time data standardized, Chris, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so uh, it was about well, three or four years ago, um, when we kind of took off on this journey um, to figure out kind of what we needed to do to become more accessible to our passengers in the general public, that we even realized what GTFS was. Um, and so to, for our agency, it's a it's a really a new thing. So we began um, finding partners to kind of help us manage our GTFS. And we, we embarked on that. Well, we got the GTFS up and going. And well, this is great. Um, because we can, you know, send, you know, send people to Google Maps or Apple Maps or wherever they can consume that and plan trips. But then along came this thing called GTFS real time. And so um, that was even more cutting edge with that. That's even better uh, to really pro provide real time information to our passengers. And we've never done that. You know, when we talk about um, service adjustments or alerting passengers or, or that kind of thing, um, you know, several years ago, probably within the last five to eight years ago, we were scrambling around trying to find, uh, you know, print pieces of paper, run it out to a bus stop and make those kinds of adjustments. But um, as we've gotten into this new scape, you know, we, we oh, from there, we transitioned into really trying to use a lot of social media, you know, route changes and detours and those kinds of things. But uh, that's just not a real effective way um, to get that because you're not getting to the customer uh, when they're trying to plan their trip. I mean, you're having it, they're planning a trip, but then they're having to go check Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is to find out, you know, where, where, where you're going instead of um, going to your planning app. So, uh, you know, we really look forward to the GTFS RT, the service. So we can be more, again, I mean, it's, it's, it is what it is. It's called real time for a reason. And so that we can get that information to our passengers instantaneously without having to hope that they go check another, uh, you know, social media platform or without us having to print and try to run out to a bus stop to close it and those sorts of things. So um, the GTFS changed significantly and changed the way that we operate and the way we think about it. But the GTFS RT is significantly going to enhance our uh, operations. And, and again, like I mentioned earlier, we want to we want to bring two things together with our micro and our fixed route, and you can't really do that effectively when you have a live kind of a real time feed in your micro transit app, and and you have a static feed coming for a bus because you don't know if that's late. Then again, you don't know if that's going to be on detour 
or the app doesn't know if it's going to be on a detour or what's going on there. So to really make that effective, we've got to get both of our services in real time feed where they're talking to each other in the language they can both understand and effectively communicate that out to the pasture, whatever it is. Uh, and so they can really take hold of their own uh, planning, their own journeys. Thanks, Chris. I hadn't even really considered the thought of uh, actually without that data, it kind of forces passengers to be reactive. Like you said, jumping into Facebook or something when they're just trying to get their ride and their planning app. Um, so that was a really interesting perspective. And Connie, how, how are you thinking about data standards and these data feeds and maybe how they, they've enabled you all to be a little more proactive? Um, certainly has significantly improved the consistency of the and quality of the information across our different teams. So for in, in addition to um, uh, app-based uh, information, we also have a number of people who still call into um, our call center and have been able to give us the right information across our team so that our agents are actually pulling that information up and it's consistent across all of the data sources, which is really something relatively new to us. Uh, in our driver shortages, we've had to combine trips or sometimes drop trips and, and being able to get a post out um, uh, as soon as, as we know has been helpful as well in terms of letting folks know the bad news. Um, and uh, that's been a big deal for us. And then Game Changer has been the detours, the, the operations management um, uh, detour management feature has just been, um, for some reason, every intersection in our small city <laughs> is undergoing some sort of torn up. It's it's uh, remarkable the number of, of detours that come up every single day, multiple times a day, and, and we could not do it without, uh, without Swiftly. That's kind of bittersweet. <laughs> I'll take the praise, but uh, I apologize for your intersections being torn up. And Josh, how, how about you? How are you thinking about data standards? Yeah, so honestly, what you guys said is, is how we have experienced uh, these data centers as well. And due to that, all the we're really only looking at new technology if it uses GTFS real time and the static feed as it's like backbone of the uh, software. Um, we actually use uh, Trillium to manage our GTFS feed and then uh, that's the manager and then we do it, we build it in house. Um, so we, we, you know, really get control over that and we can make any changes um, as we, as we need. And uh, yeah, so we're only, we try our best to only look at technology from the hardware to, to the software that can just take the feed and, and run. So that way we don't have to do any more uh, backend, you know, sending our schedules to people to go build it into their own private um, format. It's just plug and play. Thanks, Josh. I want to carry that thread a little bit more. Um, I, I think when, at least in the last couple of years, when we've seen folks thinking about GTFS real time or the APIs that come, come with some of this powerful information, there's a lot of talk about software applications, trip planning applications, but you just mentioned hardware. And so I'd be curious about kind of the ways in which you might have uh, changed your approach to hardware procurement based on these standards. And like, how does having a source of truth in a standard format like GTFS real time give you more flexibility um, or give you more optionality when it comes to working with what you want on your vehicles? Yeah, so, so right now, I guess we're looking at a procurement for some digital signage at stops. So not necessarily on the vehicle, but definitely part of our facilities. Um, and Th those signs were only really trying our best to look at companies. Part of our procurement is uh, one of the criteria is that um, it, I guess the hardware has its own uh, software component that just takes the feed and, and plugs it in. So that way we can uh, just move forward without having to connect much. Um, and I know that Swiftly itself has worked with a lot of different hardware um, companies out there. So that's that's a part of it too. Is you know we can just look at what's already been done before, so that way we don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, moving forward. And that for for anything, um, we'd love to move forward, eventually getting more of our digital signage on the vehicles uh, connected to the internet and connected to our GTFS feed. Um, that's what we're working on getting the um, waste sign uh, 
uh, audio announcements uh, coupled with a digital sign a scrolling LED of what's the next stop is coming up uh, and everything like that. And it's just, we're hoping to, to get that all squared away with our GTFS. Thanks, Josh. And how about you, Connie? What what do you think about with respect to hardware and, and connectivity with a standardized data feed? Um, I mean, this is an extraordinarily exciting area for, for us and, and for me. Um, we're a relatively small agency. I have worked at larger agencies and any of the automated password accounting systems and the onboard stop announcement systems, those are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and dedicated staff or consultants and and we're just not scaled to uh, to staff those types of projects, and so as a result, we don't have a lot of the the, the essentials that I would consider to be um, best practice at this point. Um, we've we've been spending tens of thousands of dollars on ride classic ride checks like one and two. So you know, we're when I found out that we that that swiftly could push or or host. Uh, in a viable APC system at a extraordinarily inexpensive price point that got me very excited and we were able to wire in uh, iris uh, counters and we're in the process of working with swiftly on uh, implementing that and we're doing it on five buses because we just that's our capacity at this point to to host that and we look forward to incrementally um, bring across the system that we didn't have to bite off a $200,000 project, we're able to do it for like twenty dollars to $25,000. And so that that scalability was was huge for us because we just don't have that bandwidth. Um, and then the the open, um, the Samsara trackers, which is an OBD based uh, vehicle um, information system that ties in a lot of the um, onboard engineering systems around uh, hours and engine status and, and uh, gear, uh, gear information. Uh, has been a game changer for us as well. We are so excited to actually have an AVL system that gives us much more transparency on the mechanical condition of the fleet for virtually, I don't know, it's it, it, the installation takes us about 10 minutes a unit. They're relatively inexpensive and it's just, uh, it, we're able to do a lot more as a small agency with these types of, of IRIS systems, but it's all running off the cradle point um, that's connected with with the swiftly um, being the brain of the entire system. So that scalability and that ability to kind of roll it out as we're able to host it um, has been really in, important for us. So we're very excited to to do it, but able to do it in a in a way that we can do it. Thanks, Connie. Do you have any thoughts on the topic, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm much of what Connie and Josh said. I mean, that's, I mean, those are kind of the, the benefits there, but you know, the, the only thing that I would add is we talk about this, the, the, what I've learned um, over the last probably six months to a year is, you know, we, we, I feel like we were trapped with our, one of our previous vendors, as far as um, the, the folks that are providing some CAD AVL for us, you know, we, we, when, when that was procured prior to me getting here, but when we got here, it's just like, you know, everything that we're doing in that in that environment, we're, we're trapped by what they were to provide. And so what 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 I've learned over the last six, 12 months is um, we can take ownership of that and we can take that control back to ourselves. Um, and, and it all starts with the with the modem on board. And then we have the ability to plug and play whatever other, other options we want into that modem um, for for anything we want. So we're not going to be stuck with uh, one specific vendor providing all these things, we can we can really be strategic in who we want to partner with and who who we want to utilize to provide that information we want to the general public. So that's kind of the big thing that we that I found in this deal is, is this um, this kind of uh, the the product that Swiftly brings to us is allowing us to kind of get out from underneath that trap and really kind of take control of what we are trying to do and allow us to make the decisions about the different partners that we want to be able to plug in to. Uh, the modem and to be able to produce any time information. So, I mean, we have a we have a pretty big um, big eyes looking to the future about what this could possibly do um, for us. But we're having to start really really small and and really is um, getting that information. I mean, we can um, you know plug our cameras in and get real time feeds there um, in, in in live operations from the back end, looking at where buses were, um, where they're going. You know, on the, so all those kinds of things from a manager tool, from a passenger tool. Uh, I mean, it's really going to be, it's an exciting time for us because we're able to kind of get out from underneath that control and really start being, um, looking to what we kind of want it to be and being very strategic about those partnerships. Thanks all. 
Uh, so as you mentioned, this this kind of flexibility and control and taking back that power um, and not really feeling locked in, Chris, I think that resonates with a lot of folks that I've talked to in the industry. And then something that also comes up is that uh, it, it can also be a little daunting or scary to go with something new. And I think like taking back that control may also mean some fears around how do I implement something aftermarket? How, how does that happen? Why can't I just, you know, throw it all and close my eyes and hope that it works at the OEM. Uh, so I'd love to learn a little bit more about how implementation has gone and how this has become possible for you all. Um, so like whether that's from the data standardization perspective or just thinking about getting modems on board your vehicles, talk to me about what that's been like. Yeah, so for, for us, it's, I mean, it's, it's, um, I, I would just say change is um, the new normal in, in, in any environment is, is just like our agency, you know, we have folks here that do not want to change. I mean, they've gotten used to doing something um, a certain way, and they know how to do it that and, and they want to do it that way. Um, but to really, we need to be able to, we, we need to get away from manual processes and getting to a part where we're leveraging technology to free up our time to actually be able to do the things that we need to do, which is directly affect the, the passenger uh, and making sure we get them to where they need to go. And so, um, it, you know, after we've kind of gotten our, our, our group convinced that change is a good thing and getting away from what the traditional way of, of doing this and has been in the past for our agency, you know, we've gotten a lot of folks, people are coming on board with this. They've gotten some of our you know, customer service and dispatch folks have gotten um, their hands on the Swiftly dashboard. And I've heard nothing but praise from them. And they're very excited about what it allows them to do. Um, and and, and the, the kind of getting into this, while it took took us quite a while to make the decision to partner with Swiftly because we wanted to really evaluate what was out there and ensure that we were making the right decision. And, you know, at some point, you know, you, you may make a wrong decision and that's OK. It's a risk that we're willing to take to try to move our agency forward. And so um, once we made that decision, we've heard a lot of positive things. And so um, the Im implementation, I mean, I think the biggest headache for us is really getting the modems installed. If we can get the modems installed, everything else is going to pretty much fall into place and be ready to go. Um, and I haven't mentioned we're also going to be using the the, the Wayside AVA uh, in, in announcements. And so we were uh, doing some testing with that last week and trying to and making sure that was going correctly. But as we were doing that, it's kind of, it gave us a really kind of a look and a, well, what if we did this? Well, what if we did this? Well, what 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 about? And so it's kind of endless possibilities now that we have this modem on board with a good GTFS RT. And so it's really opening up our eyes to other things that we can do to make our operation better, but also make it better and more convenient for the passenger. Thanks, Chris. And uh, Connie, I know you and I have talked a little bit more about kind of that that aftermarket, the value of, of going in that direction. So I'd love to hear for a couple, uh, your thoughts on, on what implementation has been like. Well, I'll go off script a little bit. Hopefully sure. my boss isn't on the phone. <laughs> um, so usually these projects are multiple years, hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and RFPs that are dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of pages long, where you have to have every iota and everything sort of planned out. And frankly, um, we've been able to run a little bit more um, with scissors uh, down the hall and uh, get out of the all or nothing approach where we need long uh, project timelines and we're, we're working incrementally in small pieces uh, and starting to build the business case for things like APC and um, AVAS or the, the next stop uh, announcement systems because we're not going to get to yes with our stakeholders with a project that's going to cost us $500,000. We're going to get to yes because we have built a successful case study based on tens of thousands of dollars where we have five buses with certain things. Uh, and, and we just certainly, we just couldn't, we wouldn't get to yes uh, fast enough if we were trying to bite off the entire elephant at once. So, you know, there's been minimal engineering uh, for us uh, and we've been able to sort of start to work on it. I was so excited to do implant inspections at Gillig about a month ago. We have our iris, the, the wires there, it's ready to go. We're starting, uh, we're in the implementation phase now. And, and uh, you know, it's been really, really uh, an interesting process for us to, to get to yes much faster and in smaller increments that we're able to support. That's really enlightening. Thank you, Connie. Um, I want to shift to operator shortages, which you mentioned, Josh. Uh, it's been 
kind of the the elephant in the room for quite a while now during the pandemic. And something that's interesting to me as a technologist is how a lot of companies now are in kind of the delivery and, and peer-to-peer space and maybe competing for, for commercial drivers in a lot of ways. You see Amazon Prime Delivery, um, all sorts of on-demand stuff. And I'm curious about what something like the connected transit platform or this new way of, of getting information to the vehicle has done in terms of making operators' lives easier for you. Um, So maybe we'll start with you, Josh, since you did mention the operator shortages before. Yeah, so I guess this is not uh, any statistical, uh, but just from what I've seen, um, we started a new training program at our agency where we're taking anyone with uh, any license and training them all the way through their class B passenger endorsement CDL. So that way we can use them on our fixed route. And while they get started in training, they, uh, we use, we have the, um, the driver app in the buses and uh, the trainers are very good about showing the new trainees how to use that app. So they can see their schedules and it'll tell them when to leave stops on time and all that. Um, If any service adjustments happen, the dispatchers will send an update and those tablets get updated immediately. Um, On some of our vehicles, we have the turn-by-turn directions actually uh, just right there for them. And uh, what I found is that these, whenever we have these new drivers, I've got to actually go in and and create new accounts for them so they they can log in on their own once they're out. And uh, sometimes I get a little bit bogged down with my own work and I forget to upload the new training class uh, information. And uh, by the, before they get out into the, on, onto the fixed route on their own, they are definitely stopping by my office saying, hey, uh, I still don't have a login. I need that login before I get started. So I definitely know that it's useful to them. Uh, and they definitely use it uh, every day, the one, especially the ones coming out of training where they don't know our routes as well. The, ones who, the drivers who've been with us for years, they know all our routes. Uh, it, it's helpful to them. But uh, honestly, some of them even memorize the timetables at this point. So they don't need it as much, but the newer drivers definitely appreciate that extra, that extra resource available to them. And how about you, Connie? How are, how are folks using the, the tablets on board and how are you orienting your work to, to kind of make things easier or stay competitive on the operator side? Um, we are, it's on my to-do list, but we are working on the turn by turn functionality, um, providing breadcrumbs to new employees, but also using it as a way to better manage our, uh, detours. Believe it or not, we have operators who just won't listen to detour instructions, for example. So, uh, those breadcrumbs are, we're looking to reduce our, our training time. Our training time is extraordinarily long. We're talking six to eight weeks. Uh, and a lot of it is the root familiarization training, and not that they are, they still will receive the that training level, but we can perhaps uh, shorten things down by about a week if we're able to um, provide some of the, the the breadcrumbs to provide that extra level of confidence uh, to new and uh, new operators um, uh, for the service. So we're looking forward to that. And we'll, we'll tie things up on this front with you, Chris, because you haven't fully deployed this implementation. What are you hopeful about with respect to uh, getting information out for your drivers and for your operators on board? So, you know, and, and talking with our law operators and everybody knows this, I mean, you know, you are, as an operator, I mean, you you are your frontline customer service interfacing with passengers. And, and, and when you're dealing with, you know, people, there's a lot of challenges that could come from that. And, and so, Really what our focus is, is we, we want to try to take everything, every little thing that we can take away from the frontline driver, everything that we can remove from them and make them to be able to where they can focus on the customer service piece of that and essentially the driving. Um, if we can get them to focus on those two things and remove all the other things, um, you know, the ADA announcements and, uh, you know, the the, all the detour, trying to free, remember the route and all those, we, we, we try to use a lot of leverage to remove all those things away from them. That way they can focus on what they really need to be focused on and that's driving and the, and the passengers. And so that's kind of where we see this going is really assisting us in getting that to the point where we can make it easier for our drivers to do their job each and every day. And, and our drivers are our life, our, our, our bloodline. I mean, they are wonderful here. I mean, we have a 
a bunch of really, really good drivers, but to be attractive and to kind of um, bring in more new people, we've got to make it to a point to where we can sell them on, you know, you focus on passenger, you focus on driving, everything else that we're going to, we're, we'll take care of. So that's kind of the, the direction we're going. And, and I think this is a really big piece of what we're going to do. And it's really going to help out those uh, recruiting efforts. Speaking of the direction you're going, I would love to close out our kind of open conversation now before heading into Q&A with a, a look forward. So if you could, each of you kind of in 30 seconds or so, uh, tell me what you're looking forward to with respect to this connected transit model. What does it enable you to do in the future that you've not been able to do before? Um, or maybe what do the next three to five years look like for your agency in terms of transit data and technology? Help us move to the future with you. I'll open the floor. Any of you can jump right in. All right. Uh, I guess just listing a few technologies we're working on. So we're working on the uh, um, audio announcements. We're working on APCs. We have them on all of our vehicles, but we also still need to get them certified um, so we can eliminate those tallies uh, that we're getting manually from the drivers, as Chris mentioned, to you know make their lives easier. Just keep them focused on driving, let the APCs do the counting. Um, but once all that gets settled, we want to tie that into our website and create a good uh, front page for our passengers that if they're going to Google and find our website, that it's not they're not just getting static downloads of our, of our maps and schedules. We want to be able to have a live map and, uh, and live schedules on, on our public-facing website. Um, and then all the way tie that into our paratransit service as well. I know that's not what Swiftly does, but we're trying to move down that whole technology route and get our paratransit passengers the ability to uh, request rides using a mobile app and update and manage those rides and, and do everything. Try to give the passengers the, the freedom to see, you know, con control their, their day to day lives as much as possible, uh, especially when connecting with us. And then that helps our internal customers from our, our customer service representatives to our dispatchers. If everyone's using the same technology, uh, the same data stream, uh, it just, everyone's looking at the same numbers. So there's less confusion. Uh, for GMT, obviously, as we've discussed, um, our AVAS stop announcement and APC systems. But in addition to those systems, Right now, we've been doing it on our heavy urban. Uh, we're looking to roll that out across the entire fleet, including our cutaway fleets. Fair collections on our horizon, and, and that um, is obviously a big issue for us. And then I'll throw a curveball yard management system. We're looking at um, a near field um, real time displays. We have a major problem in our downtown terminal where we don't have a, we don't have the ability to have assigned uh, a terminal bays. So um, the buses come in scrambled and our, we have we have blank um, uh, dis video displays over each uh, dock and uh, the t because we the buses aren't talking to the signs and that was always part of the the implementation for that so near field real time displays in our terminals and yard management a, a big one for us as well yeah, and so for us, it's it's more about you know right now the getting uh, swiftly on board to get that GTFS RT. So you know again, you know bringing our micro transit and our our fixed route together. That's kind of our number our primary focus in short term. Um, we've partnered with uh, the Dallas area Rapid Transit to bring their Go Pass to town, and so that'll be kind of our app of choice. And and we want to be able to take our fixed route and micro transit, put it in there. So when 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 the pastor goes to book their journey, I mean they have every option that's listed in there, whether it be micro to fixed route micro only bikes walks whatever it is we want them to be able to go to that app and be able to 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 uh to book that journey um but more importantly you know that's going to be our app of choice but you know we're not going to discriminate against any other app that anybody wants to use if they if the pastor wants to use you know name your other app they welcome to it you know i find a lot of uses out of using the google maps and and in in, in planning journey so there's a lot of i mean we're, we're really just want to get to the point where we can provide that um, pasture with the with the greatest amount of information they can um, uh, digital signage at the terminal digital signage on the routes at the stops I mean I, I, you know they, I could go on for a long time and kind of where we see this going but it all is going to boil back to getting that good GTFS GTFS RT feed and once we establish that get that going I mean that's going to set us up for a lot of open opportunities in the future 
thank you all. Uh, I'll share my screen again so folks can understand where we are. Um, and it is question time. So we received a handful of great questions as we discussed things. And I will start off with this one. Not sure if any panelist is experiencing high trip cancellations at their agency. If so, how has the perception of service reliability from customers changed now that your agencies can provide real-time cancellation of trips due to the bus operator shortage? Uh, I guess I can start. Um, yeah, that's un unfortunate. We, uh, everywhere I've been since the pandemic, I I've actually moved agencies during the pandemic, um, has, high, has had high can trip cancellations, which is not where we wanna be in this industry. Um, the uh, trip cancellations on swiftly and going to the real-time feed um, has definitely helped, but to be completely honest, not, not enough where we're not hearing anything about it. Uh, what has helped is, is back in February, we committed to uh, the service that we can provide. So we reduced our service uh, decently significantly back in February, just so that way we can actually uh, hit what we say, you know, do what we say we're going to do. And then now we're in the process of rebuilding and bringing back that service. Um, so we're, we're, we've brought back some, we have plans to bring back hopefully the rest or maybe not quite all of it in November. So every kind of three months, we're going to bring back whatever we can manage um, until we get back to normal uh, pre-pandemic. Um, so the technology aspect has helped, but, uh, Either way, someone's trip is getting canceled, so people are not happy. So our, our method has just been reduce the number of trips that we promise the public. Thanks, Josh. I'll, I'll jump to the next question and we can try to, to get through all of these in short order. Um, so how have you used this real-time data to revise your schedule running times and improve your on-time performance? Yeah, I, I think I, I chimed in on that one already. It's it's probably job one or two, or actually job two on, on what we do. Um, we use this information uh, at GMT to update our operator schedules every run. Uh, we review them, look for anomalies, and are looking at uh, time of day variations and everything that we can do to improve our, our running time uh, accuracy across the system. So it's a vital part of that because we really hadn't very little or very poor transparency on our on-time performance, uh, particularly within an intra intra route um, within a single run, um, high variability with uh, intermediate stops and such. So it's been an instrumental for us. Thanks, Connie. And I will ask one more question from the audience before we kind of close things out today. Where is the industry going in defining standard architectures and protocols to allow more seamless interoperability? There's a lot out there actually for that. Um, a lot of different uh, people are working on different things. There's some GTFS reporting standards that some are trying to work on and, and tie into NTD. So that way it's just easy reporting for NTD and more standardized across the nation. Um, there's uh, the detours, trying to get the GTFS to get that real-time uh, feed to actually take in detours. That way, when you plug in the detour, the passengers can see a new line drawn on their map showing what new stops are being added in a matter of minutes. Um, so there's all sorts of stuff. I guess that's really open-ended. So I'll just say I'm excited about the future, but it's it's a little bit slow to you know get something accepted across across the nation. I think that was generally what you were trying to ask there. Thanks, Josh. All right, we had one more squeeze in here and I think we can do it. Um, so it, uh, I think this may be targeted more towards you, Connie. We're talking about some of the, the procurement and money things, but anybody is welcome to answer. So how have you procured a system like this? And did you use grants? We did use grants. We are using grants. Um, those grants are hosted by our state funding agency um, through Standard Capital Program, uh, the 5307. Um, so uh, we are definitely using grants, but it's under kind of an, um, a generic umbrella uh, of uh, capital investment. So it's not a specific uh, standalone project. It's just sort of where it's uh, it's crumbs in the in the in the sofa cushions um, approach. 
Uh, for us, you know, around the, the hardware standards and such, you know, we are still noodling the ultimate um, tablet and where the tablet placements are. We do work with Swiftly closely on and then the installations. We have these mammoth GFI Fairbox controller heads that, that do very little, but take up a tr tremendous amount of real estate. And I think uh, Chris was speaking to reducing the number of distractions. So um, we really look forward to sort of pulling all of our OEMs together and getting best practice on how we reduce the, the dash clutter um, that really sort of is baffling to, to me and also improving how we deal with the proprietary um, legacy products that we've got with GFI on, you know, that's taken up a lot of real estate and, and we would love to be able to, uh, in our next uh, fair collection system, be able to, to offer uh, a universal tablet for all uh, business functions, including Swiftly and, and fair collection systems in a single unit that's not gonna take up the entire dashboard. Thanks y'all. Uh, one minute later than my mental model had wanted me to finish. So I feel like we're on great time here and I really appreciate all the amazing insights that you've offered today and in our relationships and conversations uh, to date before this. So, uh, whoops, that was my slide that I had meant to put up during the Q&A, but uh, everybody did great with those questions anyway. So I want to round things out by just thanking you, our panelists, um, for these discussions. I also want to thank all of our participants for joining. If you ask any questions that didn't get answered today, um, feel free to follow up and ask the Swiftly team. We love to, to respond and wrangle those kinds, kinds of answers. And then of course you can always get in touch and learn more about connected transit platforms and Swiftly's offerings at goswift.ly. Uh, we will record this webinar and it will be shared out to the folks that registered and beyond. So you can always take a look back when you need it. Thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your week.